Hey, everybody. Denver Riggleman here with Coalition of the Sane, hashtag COTS. I am a former congressman, former senior technical advisor for the January 6th committee, and a former intelligence officer for the Air Force and shh, the National Security Agency. And today, I'm here and I am proud to interview Jenny Cohn. She is an open source intelligence research specialist. She is an expert on Christian nationalism, an expert on election security systems. She writes for the Bucks County Beacon. She also writes for Crow, C-R-O-W, which is the Christian Right Observer Weekly. And she's an expert on Project 2025. This is going to be exciting. We can't wait to talk Christian nationalism and the bridge to what's happening now. And we could have another January 6th. So I'm really excited about this. And uh, let's get to work. Hey, everybody. I am so excited to be here with Jenny Cohn on Coalition of the Sane. Uh, one of my favorite people on X, Twitter, whatever we call it now, uh, writes for the Bucks County Beacon, but also for Crow. Uh, it's the Christian Right Observer Weekly. And that that actually makes sense based on your background and tracking Christian nationalists, your incredible, exhaustive knowledge of this. That's why I was so excited to uh, talk to you. But I do have a crazy question, Jenny, right from the beginning. Here on the coalition is saying, I like to ask people, when was the time when you knew you had to get involved? Was there a moment or a time where you're like, you know what? I got to do something. I know you have a background as an attorney, smart as hell. When was that time when you're like, I have to do something? This is nuts. So um, thank you for having me on your show, first of all. I'm Sorry a huge fan of your work as well and your book. I have your book. Um, so yeah, so after the 2016 election, um, I was just on Twitter like everybody else because our new president was on Twitter was on Twitter all the time and and there were I saw the reports about Russian interference and in particular the attack on our election infrastructure and somebody on Twitter asked if anyone had time to help research um, I guess our election auditing laws I think was specifically what he was asking about but also just sort of the whole voting machine situation how how vulnerable our election infrastructure really was. So when I started looking into it, what really stood out to me was the um, connections between America's largest voting machine vendor, ESNS, and the Christian right and the Republican Party. And, and also just um, the corruption, I felt, of the whole system of these voting machines and um, the politicians who would decide to buy them would often get donations from the different vendors. And so it was just... It was a lot more corrupt than I expected and also more vulnerable than I expected um, in terms of we still had a lot of paperless machines in that election, the 2016 election. And according to very well-respected experts, a paperless machine, there's no way to tell really if it's been hacked. Um, you can rerun the machine, but if it's been hacked, you'll get the same result. You really need paper ballots, hand mark, marked with a pen to double check. And it turned out like that Hillary Clinton of all people, actually, when she was in the Senate was one of the only, she and Chuck Schumer were like the only two people who opposed the Help America Vote Act, which is what enabled these paperless voting machines. And she was worried, she said at the time that she was worried about stolen elections. When I started seeing all of this, like looking a little bit under the hood of our um, election infrastructure, I got really freaked out. And did know that I had the skills to write about it because I had practiced law for so long and the type of law I did, which is insurance coverage, involves condensing large volumes of material, looking for not the facts that are in dispute, but the undisputed facts and focusing on those. And so that was kind of what I did for a long time, trying not so much to claim, I couldn't claim to prove that there had been fraud in the election or that Trump really didn't win, and I never claimed to. In fact, people would tell me often, they'd be like, why won't you just say, you know, that he's he, he won because of fraud? I'm like, because I can't prove it. But what I could prove was the need to um, further secure our elections. And so I worked really hard on getting an election security bill that had good provisions in it with Congress. And I actually worked a bit with Ron Wyden's office, who re was reading my work. And the GOP blocked the bill before the 2020 election. Marsha Blackburn, who was Trump's 2016, um, she was on his transition team. And she's a Republican no from Tennessee. And yeah, yeah. She, she blocked the bill that I per had spent. I mean, I spent like all, 10 hours a day every day trying for this. And then, of course, the big lie hit and I was just devastated. They flipped the entire narrative inside out. It had been the Republicans that were obstructing election security legislation. And um, 
Yeah, you know so I started that. That was anyway. That's a long answer, but that's what how I. That's what we need to know. Here. What's great about us and, and on this show is we want to we want those answers, right? We want to know the truth. We want to know why you got into it. I'm very familiar, absolutely, with Dominion, Smartmatic. I don't think a lot of people know that Eric Coomer, uh, who was sued as the sort of the leader of the security um, apparatus for Dominion Voting Systems, we went to the mm-hmm. same high school. Uh, we oh, graduated really? the same year. Yeah, we did. Oh, that's and didn't even know that was happening while I was getting bombarded because I was the first to come out against QAnon and, and all that kind of stuff. So pretty incredible that two, you know, people from Manassas, what we call we're Manassholes, right? Uh, what we're doing, right? And, and going small forward world. and doing that. It is such a small world. But what you already saw, and I think if, if I may, is you saw felons and the financial flows to felons who are who are then trying to, you know, manipulate or to push certain types of legislation for voting machines that they were lobbying for with these really awful backgrounds. And that's what you see over and over again in politics are the financial flows, the fact that there's power involved. And politicians, and I was there, their staff is staffing all this, but a lot of these politicians don't even really know what's going on. They're just there to make sure that they get, you know, they get their FaceTime on camera. They're pushing comms or communications. They don't so have I time. Love, I don't nah, think so. Trust me, you know, what was it, 5,000 pieces of legislation in the 116th Congress? When you're looking at my staff, lobbyists write the bills. So you got Matt, you got lobbyists on lobbyist violence going on as they're trying to push bills towards you. You're talking to constituents, you're talking to all that, and you're really relying on your staff. Thing is, you said ESNS, and you're talking about some of these voting machines. But I love what you're saying. And when you're talking about sane, rational people, two things can be true. We can have vulnerabilities in our electronic voting. And the 2020 election wasn't stolen. Those two things can be true. Those Um, two things can absolutely be true. Um, I just, yeah, I felt like having blocked election security legislation that would have addressed a lot of the vulnerabilities that they then used to support the big lie, that they were not in a position to do that, that they had basically, to use a legal term, unclean hands. Um, Yeah. What really got me, though, so the reason why I pivoted sort of to Christian extremism was because after the big lie came out and I was super depressed that like all momentum for election security legislation died from the Democratic Party because they ran with it being the most select, most secure election ever narrative, which it probably was, but the bar was not super high because of the GOP. Like I felt like they should have run on, no, you can't like say that the system's vulnerable and therefore we have to overturn it when you're the one who left it vulnerable, right? Um, so in any event, that that made me look to see who was behind the big lie. Like, who were the main people? How did it get so far? And as it turned out, it was largely Christian extremists and um, Roger Stone and Mike Flynn. So well, it's funny. Collaboration. It was funny you said Roger Stone. You know, I have a certain fascination with Roger Stone based on the communications we saw during January 6th. I mean, the I- only person we saw connected to all the major working groups in January 6th. And the fact that you said Roger Stone and Mike Flynn, you know, I was in a, I was in a movie about Mike Flynn or a documentary um, pretty much where, you know, that, that individual should have been wearing the uniform. It's just incredible to me uh, what he does, but you just made an incredible link um, because I love asking about this because of your uh, background and what you're good at is Mike Flynn's Reawaken America tours. And, right. you know, those things, you know, you talk about Christian nationalism, Jenny. I mean, yeah. Mike Flynn sort of is a standard bearer for it. Well, I believe I was the first one to connect the Reawaken America tour to the New Apostolic Reformation, at least at, not the first person, the first person who wrote an article doing that. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was in August of 2022. And, yeah, the sponsor of the, Ameri- uh, the Reawaken America tour is Charisma News, and that is owned by Steve Strang, who he is one of sort of the original um, New Apostolic Reformation leaders. I guess he had a falling out with the NAR over something, but something peripheral, but he still very much supports the same concepts and and he's still part of the same network. Like he still has those people on his shows. And, and obviously the Reawaken America tour featured the major NAR people such as like Lance Wall now has become kind of like the face of the NAR. Um, so I wrote all about that. What really got my attention, though, wasn't just that they were extreme. It was um, how how big of a following they had. And so there was in August or July of 2022, they had had this big rally in Georgia. Marjorie Taylor Greene was there. 
but that wasn't the most important part. It was like the four men on stage who no one had ever really, or very few people had ever heard of them unless they already were studying the NAR. Um, Lance Walnow, Dutch Sheets is another NAR leader, and then two pastors who might be NAR, although I can't prove that they're NAR, but they're certainly affiliated with NAR people, standing on this stage and reading this thing called the Watchman's Decree, which included um, a discussion of the Seven Mountains Mandate, basically the idea that they have authority from heaven to conquer, to assume leadership positions in all seven mountains of our society, and that includes like education and government and media and and a bunch of other stuff. Um, just so just pretty much everything. And, and it was saying it was, it was spoken as a decree, like we decree as messengers from God and with authority from heaven. And we decree this and we decree that. And then it panned to the audience in the stadium and the, it was filled to the rafters, just to the rafters. It was at nighttime and there were like lights blinking everywhere. And um, all these people were reciting it with them because it was on a big jumbotron. That video went viral. Nick Knudsen, on Twitter, you probably have heard of him or seen him, maybe not. Demcast founder, he is the one who posted the video. I don't think he knew that it was, he didn't know it was the NAR, um, but it was, he did a huge service by posting it. It went viral. And then I saw it and um, a Christian extremism researcher named Bruce Wilson said that it was the new apostolic reformation. I started talking with him and that's how I was introduced to it and started writing about it. So yeah. It, um, they, the collaboration between the NAR and the MAGA movement is really terrifying because they are so extreme. These are like the demon chasers, the people who accuse people of witchcraft, um, literally. Yes. And um, their their rhetoric, like they, they, they couch everything as a prophecy, but it, which is very convenient. So they'll say like, God wants these people to die. Um, that's not me saying it. That's God. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Um when you're looking at the Christian nationalist movement, Jenny, um, and I'm going to ask some questions, you know, because I've looked at it myself quite a bit. I actually read your article. You're the one who turned me on to Mike Flynn being connected to the NAR or the Reawake, Reawaken America movement. That was your mm-hmm. article. And I started looking more into the NAR, uh, especially Seven Mountains Dominionism, because the congressman in our district now just got beat because he got actually primaried by something nuttier um, who beat me because I officiated a same sex wedding. Um, it was called the tool of the Antichrist, which I, you know, I think I should get a T-shirt made. Um, you know, when you're looking at Bob Good, you know, he's a Seven Mountains Dominionism guy. Yeah. Uh, came out of Liberty University. So the NAR, Seven Mountains Dominionism, Unified in Purpose, Ziklag, you have all these things happening. And the question I want to ask you, I, I think first the listeners need to understand when we're talking about Christian nationalism. And this is the question I want to ask you. Is it yeah. more coordinated than people think? When you're looking at how they actually communicate when you're looking at those who join others on stage, when you look at the way that they do their prophecies. Now, I do think there's a lot of prophets that are competing for prophets, right, that are oh, trying yeah. to be the, the, the real ones with the direct line to the supernatural. Is it more coordinated than people think when you're talking about Christian nationalism, the MAGA Absolutely. movement, and all the groups associated with Christian nationalism? Absolutely. So there is an umbrella organization for all of these Christian right nonprofits that you hear about, or all the prominent ones anyway, and it's called the Council for National Policy. Ann Nelson uh, wrote a book about it called Shadow Network, and that abbreviates, by the way, CNP. People often call it the CNP. And um, so almost all of these organizations that you hear about are connected to the Council for National Policy, Um, usually a very, very close connection, usually one of the leaders, someone in a leadership position in the organization is belongs to the council or has belonged to the council, but usually current. So for example, you have the Heritage Foundation, um, which is, whose president is a Christian extremist named um, Kevin Roberts. He's in the Council for National Policy. So is the Heritage Foundation's um, founder, one of its co-founders, Ed Fulner is in the Council for National Policy. Then let's see, you go to Turning Point USA, which is Charlie Kirk, attacks a lot of the school boards and, um, He's in the Council for National Policy. I just found out yesterday because I was looking at the coordinated attacks on the public schools and um, Patriot Mobile, which I knew that they were Seven Mountains people, right? But yes. I didn't. I hadn't checked to see if anyone was in the Council for National Policy. And sure enough, their founder, um, Gary Story, I think his first name is Story. It's Glenn Story. Glenn Story. He's in the Glenn Council Story. for National Policy. The Alliance Defending Freedom, which led the attack on Roe versus Wade, um, was led for years until this, like, until last year, by Michael Ferris, Council for National Policy. Um, Moms for Liberty is probably 
I actually, I would be surprised if they don't have an advisor or like an original founder in the um, council now. We don't have the most, I only have directories through 2020 and they weren't found by me. Other people, other organizations have found them. It's documented and um, another one, Brent All Press is really good. Yes, the the Council for National Policy, CNP, you know, Jenny Thomas, our good friend, yeah, uh, wife of uh, Clarence Thomas was in CNP Action. Uh, but when you talk about Michael Ferris, <clears throat> I don't know if you already know this, Michael Ferris, uh, I think it was the December 5th, a text message to Mark Meadows. And, you know, our team deciphered the Mark Meadows text messages. He's the one who said that he got Eastman over the line. Um, so you had, yeah, no, Jenny I didn't know that. I yeah, knew he goes through yeah. Ken Paxton's brief trying to overturn the election. Yeah. So Ferris which ran for lieutenant governor here in Virginia, and, he, and he's a bit of a nutter. Um, oh, and he's so, definitely a nutter. <laughs> so, yeah. but, but Michael Ferris is associated very closely with Jenna Ellis. Um, yes, so he's, like, you, he's her mentor, I think. And, you know, he's, he's the one who was in the text messages to Mark Meadows, you know, where they asked, hey, I can help you get Eastman over the line. And then he said, hey, I got him over the line. Uh, while he was working with Jenna Ellis. Also, you got the Ed Martins, the Jenny Beth Martins, you know, in the text messages, of obviously Jenny Thomas, but the CNP is littered throughout the Meadows text messages. And when you were talking about, when you said Michael Ferris, you know, Jenny, that's what I love about what you're doing. That is something that people should know. They should know that Michael Ferris, what his affiliations are, what he does for the CNP, how he's connected to Jenny Ellis, how he's connected to Jenny Thomas. And also he's one of, a great friend of Eastman, Right, who got him over the line as far as he self-professed in the Mark Meadows text messages. So when you look at Christian nationalism in the CNP, all those conspiracy theories, all that Donald Trump is ordained by God nonsense was littered throughout the Meadows text messages. So when I see you write about the NAR, uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, I want our listeners to know the danger of the coordination that you discussed, but the fact that the NAR, CNP, Seven Mountains, UIP, CPI, the Conservative Partnership Institute, Heritage, Turning Point USA, all these cats, Patriot Mobile, all these Alliance Patriot Mobile, Freedom. yeah, just did a take on Patriot Mobile. What was it? You oh, know, women, that, just, uh, wait, Moms for America, this uh, uh, Concerned uh, Women for America, those are all CNP. All CNP. And so you have this massive baseline of belief systems that the Bible should be um, where laws actually generate and that anybody outside the left, right parameters of the Christian religion really are othered, right. Or dehumanized or Demonic. they're outside. Influenced De by well, demons. Yeah. Yes. Influenced by demons. Right. I mean, like I said, I was called tool of the antichrist. And I like to use that. My wife right. was called the spawn of Satan. And my guess is Jenny, if that's the truth, we're the, we're the actually most powerful couple in the United States, right? We are the true power couple. <laughs> you know, if we have those monikers associated with us. So I feel more powerful if, already. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, who is your, ah, I love this. So if you had to prioritize, and this is a tough question, yeah. you'd be like, gosh, Deborah, really? If you had to prioritize, who is the, and I have a name, who is the person that you think Leonard is Leo. most of, Ah, <laughs> my God, dang it. You, damn it. Leonard Leo, Tony Perkins, those two. Damn uh, it. Um, that's it. That's it. I can't, I can't anymore. You're too good at this. Leonard Leo is my number one. So I can, so fast um, on the uptake. And I, could you explain to your listeners, or our listeners? And he's in the CNP, Cots, Board of Governors. The, mm -hmm. um, thank you. You're wonderful. Um, why is Leonard Leo the one at the top of your list? Well, Tony Perkins is sort of, if people don't know Tony Perkins, you might want to explain because he's sort of obvious. And But Leonard Leo, great job. That's And I'm saying because I agree with you and that was my number one. But damn, yeah. you were on it like, oh, like right yes. now. So he was the head of the uh, Federalist Society for years, which is sort of like a, a legal network for the Christian right. And um, he is a Catholic extremist. He's not NAR, but he's very, very, takes the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church very literally, like, like the head of the Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts. So that means like no abortion ever, um, no exceptions. They oppose, the Roman Catholic Church opposes contraception. So I, I haven't found yet a quote of Leonard Leo saying he opposes that, but Kevin Roberts, I did find it. So he, again, head of the Heritage Foundation opposes contraception. Like, and I'm not talking about just the IUD or like the day after, like birth control pills, all of it, except yeah, maybe, I think maybe condoms are okay. I'm not, no, I don't think you so. Think? I, think I don't think rhythm, so. I don't think so. I think the rhythm method is the only one that might possibly. Yeah. Be. Yeah. I, you know, um, um but I, know, so 
Yeah. I came to Leonard Leo. I'm just always amazed by how much I don't know. Like, I think I have a really good grasp on everything. And then I realize, oh my God, there's this whole separate thing. And so Leonard Leo um, is largely responsible for the makeup of our Supreme Court. He was heavily involved in five of the six right wing justices. The only one in, in there making it onto the bench, the only one where apparently he wasn't is um, Justice Thomas, who's his good friend. So he actually appeared in a painting at, you know, that billionaire Harlan Crow. Um, oh, yeah. I might get that out. framed and put in my house, Jenny. I was thinking about getting that, that painting get framed, print. put in my house. Oh, we, we should get prints. There would be a copyright issue. But, yeah, that would be so cool. And um, just to do it for ourselves, we could do it. Maybe not. Yeah, we could. But, That's right. We could do it ourselves. Um, but in any event, so, yeah. And so and he's also good friends with Alito, um, who he went on a fishing trip with, with billionaire Paul Singer. And then perhaps most blatantly during the Trump administration, he provided the list from which Trump chose his three nominees who were successfully made their way onto the bench, which is Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, and Neil Gorsuch. And um, so he has the Supreme Court. What, so he's already taken care of that. And, that and, oh, and, and then I found a clip of um, one of his good friends, Tim Bush, at the Napa Institute um, saying mm. that he that literally, he, that he was bragging that he calls it the Leo court. He literally calls the Supreme court, the Leo court, because he said that Trump shepherded on the conservative, the three justices that tra radically changed the direction of the court. And he was referring, this was in, I think it, I don't, I'd give a date. I think it's June, 2022, but it could be wrong, but that right was right after Roe versus Wade had been overturned. So he was bragging that that's how they well, got versus weight overturned. He has a lot of money too, right, Jenny? I mean, what well, is it Well, that's the thing. So what makes him uber dangerous now, that that damage has largely been done, although it could get worse, actually. There could be more retirements and more extreme justices put on even still. Um, is he got a $1.6 billion donation from some dead guy. I mean, donated it to him very, very side. He has a whole network of organizations that he disperses this money to. And 40 of the partners at the time there were only 75 partners in project 2025 40 of those were affiliated with leonard leo so he's probably the kingpin behind leonard leo and then i i, I started looking to see his connections to um some of the people that seem to be the leaders of project 2025 so like steve bannon is not technically a leader but media matters had done a report showing that he's the unofficial media home of project 2025 he's always championing it and defending it and defending Christian nationalism when people are exposed for in Project 2025 for being affiliated with Christian, na ex overt Christian nationalists, people who call themselves that. He's always the one defending it. And he belonged, he sat on the board of Reclaim New York with Leonard Leo. That's a Rebecca Mercer. This is before Leonard Leo had his Oh, movies. our good friend, Rebecca Mercer. My goodness. Yeah. You know, it's those connections I've been looking at in the coordination because when I saw the Meadows text, when I saw Jenny Thomas, when I linked all the CNP individuals, when I linked, linked all the CPI individuals, then you're talking about Mike Flynn, you're talking about Reawaken America, uh, then you're talking about Project 2025, you're talking about the NAR, you're talking about the same people associated with these Christian nationalist organizations. Then when you look at people like Mike Flynn and Peter Navarro are authors on Project 2025, and I think people, I think people rightly are concentrating on Project 2025. But here's what I'd like people to do, what you did, Jenny. Look at the source of Project 2025 and the authors, not just heritage. Break down the actual authors and the sourcing. Because if you look at the people writing it, it should show you how batshit crazy. What they actually believe. What they and you, believe. You, and you do have to read between the lines a little bit. But I just want to say really quickly, because this is important. The guy that wrote the chapter on um, Health and Human Services, which is the one that is calls on the FDA to ban my foot. Mifepristone, which is, mm -hmm. um, I think that that's the abortion pill. <clears throat> he is Roger Severino, who uh, worked, well, his wife is Carrie Severino, who's, according to Source Watch, is a protege of Leonard Leo. She's a judicial crisis network, um, which is connected to him. But both of them came from the Beckett Fund. And Leo sits on the board of directors of the Beckett Fund. Um, so, like, a lot of the, on the social issues, which I think may very well be decisive in this election at least i hope they are because the christian right and the gop are far out of line with the the majority of voters the vast majority of voters um these people tend to be connected 
to Leonard Leo, who is a, I mean, look and see what the Roman Catholic Church believes, and that'll give you an idea of the type of society they want to create. Um, well, and they're very, you know, and the other things you have to read between the lines because, like pornography, for example, they define that to include anything that promotes homosexuality. It's actually very similar to what they're doing in Russia. So when they say we're going to ban pornography, people that might they might object to that anyway. Maybe they will. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But what I think they don't necessarily realize is that that means banning effectively any references to LGBTQ people because no one wants to. Who gets to decide what's supporting it, right? If it's if you're not criticizing it, I guess you're supporting it. And then they want to write out it's 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 really it's, bad from a human rights perspective. It's always the and same from people, other though, Jen. Oh, it is. Yeah, that's I, the other thing is it's very overwhelming, and that's why I think it is helpful to go back to the CNP. And someone actually just reminded me of this of the other this the other day because it is you know we got this group and it's, is it heritage is it the Family Research Council? I mean, it's important to hone in on the individual organizations that are kind of like the top ones, I guess. Well, all of them, I suppose because you go down to the local level matters. But for the big picture, the Council for National Policy really truly is at the top. And so even with the NAR, so for example, Lance Wall now, big NAR leader, he is on, he's like a founding member, board of directors member of Truth and Liberty Coalition in Colorado, um, which is a big player in the school board wars, especially in Colorado, but also kind of to an extent nationally, um, mostly Colorado. and. Although he's not in the Council for National Policy, the his co-board member Bill Federer is in the Council for National Policy, and so it, it all and they they collaborate. That organization expressly collaborates with the Family Research Council, whose longtime president, decade two decades, um, is a two-time president of the Council for National Policy. And, and who is that? Uh, that's Tony Perkins. Tony Perkins. Who, that's right. Yeah, I feel like those two organizations. Um, are really leading the Christian extremist crusade. But then of course you get to Lance Wall now. I just, he's more like, like the foot soldiers, the, the dumb, sorry, the- No, don't apologize. Kind of, kind of dumb. The, 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 they pull out the masses, they fill up the rallies, they filled up certainly the Stop the Steal rallies. Um, and they, they're networked in and of themselves because the way the NAR works, it was, it's a movement, not an organization, but it's a network and it's a network. Um, and th that means that everyone who's in it, they kind of share email lists and they specifically support each other. So they, they appear at each other's events. And this is a, it's an, a Christian extremist movement, but it's also an explicitly political Christian extremist movement. But you know, what gets me is, and what I love about this is we've connected the same people behind J6 planning or belief systems all the way to project 2025 through the and Christian the nationalism board bridge and, and, and the, the school, school board wars. wars. It's and all the, the same thing. It's it all is. the same, same people. It is the same people from the top down. Even Moms for Liberty. Oh, what I wanted to say, Erica Donalds is a Moms for Liberty advisor. She's married to Byron Donalds, Congressman Byron Donalds, yes. who's Roger Stone protege. Or I don't know if he's a protege, but he's very closely associated with Roger he's Stone. He's a buddy. They're buddies. Yes, they're buddies. <laughs> they're buddies. Um, she, she actually, the CMP meetings are supposed to be private, and I guess she didn't get the memo because she actually bragged on Facebook that she was had been invited to speak on not just one, but two Council for National Policy panels. She also took a job with the Heritage Foundation as a fellow, like a visiting fellow. And Moms for Liberty seems to have gotten a lot of its training from the Leadership Institute, which is led by longtime CNP member Morton Blackwell. They gave him a Liberty Sword. All the CMP organizations have sponsored Moms for Liberty events. So it's CMP, CMP, CMP everywhere. People need to look up Morton Blackwell. Actually, after I did the same sex wedding, I don't think people understand Morton Blackwell's from Virginia. So he came at me, Jenny, hard. Morton Blackwell, Jenny Thomas. He did. Oh, yeah. So Morton Blackwell, actually, I was at a meeting. Um, I met Morton. I think he actually supported me in the first election because I somehow won a convention by one vote against Christian nationalists. And then obviously the gay wedding put me off of the Christian nationalists pretty fast, you know, at the beginning. But Morton Blackwell came out against me pretty hard for my opponent, Bob Good, who is also a nutter. Seven J6 mountains. was stolen. Seven mountains. Right. So, again, I, I'm so in Virginia is, uh, you know, it's all over the country. But CNP is really Virginia based. And so is the CPI, right? And so the, the Conservative Partnership Institute, right? So you got the CPI and CNP, and they're very incestuous. Um, they swap a lot of spit, a lot of political spit. And I think people need to look up the authors and the names that you stated here today, Jenny. Listen, everyone, 
you know, we're going to have a couple hundred thousand people listen to this or watch this. And what, what you need to do is when you're listening, write down the names, look up the authors and the sourcing of these documents and what Jenny does, right, is to connect where their funding comes from, how they coordinate and who these people are evolutionary, right? Past performance is indicative. I would say future performance is indicative of past performance. So when you're looking at that, it's always the same people. That should scare the hell out of folks. Know who your enemies are or know who the people are who hate you. And I think, Jenny, that's where I'm just so grateful that you're out there doing that kind of work. It's it's hard. I would say a part of it, um, I don't think you get a lot of thanks for it. Um, I think you mostly probably get abuse for it. Uh, the fact is, is that data. Abuse. I do get oh. some things, but you know, I could certainly always could appreciate more. Um, <laughs> I think, I think I'm in it. I don't have. I think they're in a quandary about me because if they really go full throttle at me, it just would elevate. I don't have such a big platform that if they go at me, it would elevate it. And I think that they must know that. Roger Stone well, used to. Roger Stone did go af- at me, yes, and he called me like the c word, public, you know, on his uh, social media. Clever. Did he call you clever? Yes, he called me clever. I was oh, so that's what I thought. Yeah, that's that's what um, I thought. And um, th- so I would like to elevate you if you want to be. I think your research is. Be. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. I want people to know you. I want them to follow you on X. I want them to read the Christian Right Observer Weekly. What, I want what, them to read the Bucks County Week. Uh, the Bucks County um, Beacon. I just, that's Beacon. Okay, Bucks County Beacon. Yeah, the Bucks County Beacon. I want them to see this and to say, hey, what's Jenny saying about Christian nationalism today? How are these people actually linked? What's the sourcing? Because I think data is a much better profit than somebody who's a profit based on whatever spirits are talking to them that day. And I think you're a human data ingestion machine um, that actually uses that data to show people what the future could look like based on the performance of these individuals and what they've done in the past. And I think that's so important for the American public. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say, like, even the Christians in America and even the right-wing Christians in America are not nearly as extreme as the Christian right. And that's what I don't think is widely understood or appreciated. And so I found this clip of Tony Perkins. Um, Again, he's the immediate past president of the CNP, and he's the longtime president of the Family Research Council, which really leads school board wars across the country. So he's like a kingpin. He's one of the kingpins, like Leonard Leo. And he said that only nine, he said this, and only 9% of Christians, of Christians share their biblical worldview. And that's a problem. He, they're only 9% of Christians are as extreme as they are. And, um, and this was based on polling done by George Barna, who is, has some position with the Family Research Council. So it's based on their own polling. And then it, it drops to 6% of Americans that share their biblical worldview. And they want to make sure that everyone has that. And that is largely why they're attacking the schools, of course. Um, And they also, I mean, they've never, they don't want to improve public schools. I mean, they do, they want to improve them in their own sense in that they want to make them biblical, right? But for the most part, they want to destroy them because they want to replace them with religious schooling. Um, well, private, private religious schools and charters. They, they don't want to completely eliminate them, I don't think. They still want like the there's, you know, the uh, untouchable poor people, I suppose, at the bottom of the social rung to the, have to go there. But everybody oh. else, they want homeschooled or Christian schooled. Well, I think here's where we're at. I think this is where we're going to end right now is that me and you, Jenny, we need to start a group to go mm-hmm. after these specific types of Christians. I think we need to call it Christians with condoms. And I think we need to, I think we need to actually elevate. Yes, I was just thinking that. The CWC, right? We need to have Christians with condoms. We need to say, listen, 10% of you guys believe that life begins at erection. We know the other people don't. And that condoms and birth control are actually okay. And I think if we do that, Jenny, I think we can turn this thing. I think we can turn it. You know, I think we can go all in. But um, I'm just so glad you came on today. This was just absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was uh, my pleasure. And let's talk soon.